Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks for being here. Of course, I need to run my checks. You know that I'm a, a world champion in forgetting to set my audio levels. And uh, yeah, it looks like we're streaming. So yeah, let me... Yeah, so thanks all for being here. And we're doing part two of philosophy. We're discussing materialism, which, as I've mentioned, is scientific paganism. So much of the Enlightenment thinking, much of the philosophical thinking that drives atheism, and they base themselves upon this Enlightenment heritage, which is a resurgence of pagan thinking. Um, historical Christianity, hey, good to see you. Great to have you. Yeah, And we're going to look at how these ideas are pagan. They are not scientific. They are an ideological position which is incoherent. It is irrational. It is by no means scientific. Stealth Mongoose, Villainous, good to see you. Great, guys. And we also want to understand how this has attacked Christianity and how we can, using facts, using truth, using the historical method, take this information and tell these people, hold on, wait, let's stop a moment. Let's look at your ideology. Let's look at its roots. Let's look at its implications. And of course, towards the end of this, we're going to look at the moral implications of this. Because this is corrosive. It is an acid that destroys society, it destroys rationality, and it destroys morality. So Joel Thomas, things are well, thank you. Good to see you. Um, and horse, of course. Good afternoon. How is it? Louisiana, is it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's jump into this one. So yeah, guys, thanks all again for being here. It's pretty cold. It's below zero here in Warsaw, Poland. Um, in Fahrenheit, that's about six feet three inches in temperature, and um, but in Celsius, uh, human, it's it's below zero right now. It's been snowing, and uh, yeah, it's cold, it's dark, but it's been a good day. So, um, yeah, please, if you do like this content, do like, do share it, uh, do subscribe to the channel. I've got a large number of viewers that are actually not subscribed. So, villainous, I hate you. If I was home in South Africa, it's fantastically beautiful summer right now. I'd be lying on the beach, taking walks in the mountains, having barbecues at night. Here I am just, yeah, trying not to freeze to death. It was, <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, lots of you are not subscribed. Uh, please do subscribe. Do click the like button. And also, I do not monetize my shows. I run no ads. I hate them as much as you do. Um, YouTube is ridiculous about that. So yeah, if you'd like to consider supporting the channel, uh, links in the description below. But let's dive in. <clears throat> we ended on this slide, looked at salvation by faith alone. Well, we looked at um, soteriology, right? The doctrine of salvation. So let's continue. Right, so let's go to the next slide. And this, oddly enough, this comes from the Encyclopedia of Occultism. And we want to look at how they take Christian ideas and how they modify those ideas, how they misrepresent them or borrow them for their own purposes. Unfortunately, as my grandfather always bemoaned, one can lead a horse to water. Yes, my grandfather used to say, you can lead a horse's ass to water, but you cannot make him think. So what can you do? But we try our best, right? We, we are battling, we're trying. South Africa is only good if, you, <laughs> if you're inside the barbed wire encampment though, yeah. Yeah, yes, villainous, it's pretty bad. Sandra, welcome, good to see you. Um, okay, so this word cosmos, right? So we have two radically different worldviews. Atheists always deny they have a worldview, but they do have a worldview. That worldview is materialistic and it has certain outcomes. Maggie's ace, welcome. And of course, Christians have a worldview and it's bound up with this idea of cosmos. You have this idea of an optimistic cosmos, designed, purposeful, made by God who cares. And then you've got this opposite pessimistic nihilistic idea of a cosmos which is purposeless, a cosmos which is random, chaotic, and there's a god or no god that cares. There's either this absentee middle position like the deists have, which is another false version of Christianity, a heresy, and you've got this stealth mongoose, it's snowing in North Yorkshire, Yorkshire, UK. Um, oh, and by the way, I, I really should get better at doing this, but welcome to all those who are new to the channel. I hope you've enjoyed the content and uh, looking forward to your comments in the in the chat. 
Okay, so the macrocosm, this is known as the whole universe. Now, this is the worldview. When you speak of worldview, it's really a universal view, a view of life, the creation of life, the meaning of life, the purpose, but not just the planet. It's the entire universe, all of creation, and that is the cosmos. Christians have a very optimistic view of the cosmos. These people have a very negative, very dark, if not even a, a conspiracy theory-based view of the cosmos because it was made for the Gnostics by a dark, evil god who stole a piece of or damaged, injured the good god and pieces of this good god's essence fell and was trapped into evil, dark, dirty matter, meaning you. And you're a god trapped inside dirt, trapped inside filth, trapped inside matter. So this is a very different conception of the world. Now, atheists may not know this, but this is where their ideas come from. Macrocosm, the whole universe, Greek, macros, long, and cosmos, the world. Now, notice here a six-pointed star formed of two triangles. A six-pointed star formed of two triangles and the sacred symbol of Solomon's seal. Now, this is obviously, you know, the six-pointed star. This would be the, the Jewish star of David or variations thereof, right? However, don't assume that this is necessarily correct. This is simply their mythology in describing this. It represents the infinite and the absolute. That is the most simple and complete abridgment of the science of all things. Paracelsus states that every magical figure and Kabbalistic sign of the Pentacles, which compile spirits, may be reduced to two, the macrocosm and the microcosm. So they can compile spirits, they can do magic. This is called theurgy, I believe, and this is also part of Islam. And Villainous says, I got this image in my brain of Carl Sagan with a, dream, with a <laughs> dreamy toothy grin saying cosmos. Yes, but why does he use cosmos? Right? There's a reason for that. It's a pagan term. That, and from their perspective, is also it kind of removes the idea of God, whereas we have, yeah, it's different to the Christian view. I, I covered that in one of my other shows when I spoke about that, why he uses that word and the meaning that he provides for it. Now, the microcosm or the pentagram, a little world, Greek, Micros, cosmos, or world. We are the microcosm. The universe is the macrocosm. A five-pointed star, not a six-pointed star, which represents man and the summation of the occult forces. Now, think of the five-pointed pentagram. Actually, let's let's go have a look at that. We we know what the pentagram is, right? Let's have a look at the pentagram. Let's bring that up. Images. This is the six five-pointed star, sorry. So upside down, of course, you have the Baphomet. This is their view of the world. Right? Do you understand the negativity? If you look at just the pentagram, you start to get negative dark images. This is the view of the world. And it was believed by Paracelsus that this sign had a marvelous magical power over spirits and that all magic figures and Kabbalistic signs, blah, 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 mark of the wolfman. Okay, right, so notice this is their worldview. Now, this comes from an Encyclopedia of Occultism by Lewis Spence. And they speak here of Logos. Now, let's, how, let's see how they, what their view of the Logos is. The term commonly used in Theosophy, and we know that's Madame Blavatsky, that goes back to um, Hermes Trismegistus. So this goes way back to Hermeticism and the supposed Egyptian mystery religions. And this designates the deity. They call him Fohat. Along with the great religions, theosophy, okay, fine, has as, a, as the beginning of its scheme a deity who in himself is altogether beyond human knowledge or conception. Yeah, so this starts to lean towards that distant deity that the Muslims worship, fine, and also maybe the Gnostics. But when the deity manifests himself to man through his works of creation, he is known as the Logos. Essentially, he is infinite, but when he encloses a ring past not within which to build a cosmos, he has set limits to himself. And what we can know of him is a constrained in these limits. To us, he appears in a triple aspect, the Christian Trinity. Now, this is from the Encyclopedia of Occultism. Notice they're utilizing Christian symbolism. They're trying to replace Christianity. They are reinterpreting Christian ideas. Now, he is a unity. So the Trinity is merely an appearance. He is a unity. This triple aspect shows him as will, wisdom, and activity. I'm not sure we would describe God as will because God is Logos. Allah is will. And from each of these came forth one of the creative life waves which formed the universe. And then, of course, and then the, the wave which brought with it the monad, that scintillation of himself which took possession of formed matter to start thereby the evolutionary process. 
Yeah, if this... Okay, fine. So this is an odd mixture of religious ideas taken from Christianity and their own occult spin on that. Order and optimism versus chaos. So the Greek concept of cosmos refers to an ordered, harmonious, purposeful universe. For the Greeks, cosmos implied beauty, structure, and rationality in the universe. There were objective principles of order, harmony, that governed the universe. As opposed to chaos, randomness, disorder, and meaninglessness. Now, we've seen how Sham Harris, Dawkins, and others have spoken about a meaningless universe, a random, disordered chaotic. Even Darwin says the very same thing about the universe. The Greeks believed the cosmos reflected a divine cosmic order set in place by the gods. The movements of the stars and planets, the succession of day and night, the cycle of the seasons, all reflected the orderly cosmos. Yes, Allah forces control by will versus Logos gives free will. Uh, here come the audio attacks for the minions of the Dark One. That, yeah, I'm showing excellent connection so you shouldn't be having anything like my i'll bring the mic closer i mean that might help but now even the proportions and the symmetries found in art and architecture were meant to reflect the objective order and harmony in the universe if you look at the way churches are designed you look at christian architecture it is meant to be something that is beautiful that is ordered that shows symmetry it's based on mathematics Cosmos was a profoundly optimistic idea. It meant the universe had meaning, purpose, and an orderliness that could be grasped by human minds. And this is where scientific thinking came about. This is where logic and rationality eventually developed Western civilization and Western scientific thinking. This is why Western civilization went on to conquer the world. It had this view that we could understand the order because someone, well, there was law because there was a lawgiver. And this person was consistent or this creator was consistent logical and we could determine that logic as opposed to irrational uncaring completely random disordered that's the pagan thinking and now you've got these atheists who've got this crazy mixture between the two yes peter foley that is correct the rings they jump through to deny god and the judgment so philosophy science mathematics and art were again these are things that came from western thinking started from christian thinking from Christian, Christian scholastic thinking. There were attempts to understand and embody the cosmic order of the cosmos. So this implies a universe of meaning governed by rational and beautiful principles of order in which the Greeks thought to understand and imitate. So chaos implies the opposite, a universe lacking reason, lacking purpose, lacking harmony. We'll see what the, <laughs> old Darwin has to say about that in a minute. So cosmos triumphed over chaos in the Greek vision except now you've got these Gnostics, atheists, and others trying to bring the chaos back. Materialism is a lack of order. It is chaos. So materialism denies metaphysical realities beyond the physical. However, it contradicts itself immediately because it relies on concepts such as mind, logic, and reason that it cannot explain in purely physical terms. This is logically incoherent. So they deny the metaphysical Yet they have to use metaphysical quantities and qualities, or rather metaphysical qualities, to, to do this denial. Which is like saying there's no spade, spades do not exist, and then grabbing a spade to dig a hole, saying there's only holes. But it makes no sense. So materialism relies on the, la on the rational, logical reasoning of your mind to advance its theories and arguments. Yet it denies the existence of non-physical minds. If the mind is purely an emergent property of the physical brain, there is no reason to trust its logical reasoning. Rationality would then be an illusion. You listen to Daniel Dennett, that's exactly what he says. That consciousness is an illusion. So if what they state is just based on illusion, there is no reason to grant it any kind of validity. The laws of logic are themselves metaphysical. They're not matter extending into space. It is not this cup that I can do this with. It's not. So logic doesn't exist according to them. So materialism, however, denies the existence of metaphysical realities. So they are denying the things they are using to prove the position that they are taking. The logical principles of non-contradiction and the excluded middle, which are two of the three um, laws of logic, the basic laws of logic, for example, are not physical entities, yet they are necessary for rational discourse and scientific methodology. How can they claim to be scientific when they deny the foundations that science is built on? Materialism 
cannot account for the metaphysical laws of logic. Oh, your sound is great. It's the Nettie in Louisiana acting up. I'll reload. Okay, yeah, I had major. I was going to do this on Tuesday, but we had snow and uh, bad weather and the, the internet was bad the whole day. I had to constantly, even the mobile network was unreliable. So I had, I had severe internet dropouts all of Tuesday as well. So without a metaphysical source of order and purpose and meaning, the purely physical universe of materialism has literally no foundation for rationality or intelligibility. Now they will claim there's some, they'll make the claim, but understand we're looking at two views, the cosmos versus the chaos. This is not a materialistic view. The cosmos has a metaphysical viewpoint. So cosmos implies an orderly, harmonious universe and chaos implies randomness and meaninglessness. Which one is closer to the Christian view? Now, strict materialism leads to a chaotic, meaningless universe without purpose or transcendent order. This also leads to an irrational, pessimistic universe, which follows. So this pessimism follows from the meaningless, purposeless universe of materialism. If there is no transcendent source of meaning or value and all ends in physical annihilation, then nihilism is the logical result. There is no ultimate purpose. An orderly, purposeful cosmos provides an optimistic framework for the meaning, ethics, and purpose of life. By the way, this is available on my coffee store. You can purchase this there if you like on my coffee store. And uh, the link is on the screen below. Support me at ko-fi.com. And um, yeah, so this, this little asterisk means that I've got notes in my um, PowerPoint that, that expand upon this. Now, materialism cannot explain the ordered finely tuned universe that we observe, nor the existence of objective moral values, nor can it explain consciousness, free will, and other realities that point to a transcendent source of meaning and order, because they claim that your consciousness merely arises from dead matter. Somehow, atoms knocking together, chemicals sloshing together in your brain, this creates consciousness. But of course, these atoms are working according to physical laws, right? It's like billiard balls hitting each other, and they are simply obeying physical laws of cause and effect, and there is nothing metaphysical about them, nothing beyond the physical, and therefore you have no free will. You are simply reacting the way a billiard ball does when one ball hits another. That is not an act of free will, that is merely a transfer of energy. So yeah, and even there they can't agree, but that's we'll discuss that another time. Now, the cosmos implies a rational power or being that creates and orders the universe, something that materialism lacks. Summary, materialism is logically incoherent. It fails to account for the very rational and ordered universe, universe that its proponents inhabit and that they rely upon in their arguments. So everything was a cosmic accident. Everything is perfect by accident. I've never seen that happen. So it leads to a pessimistic philosophy that should produce an irrational, chaotic universe rather than the orderly cosmos that we experience. So they need to claim there's some base laws or constants, but they cannot explain where those come from if all is purely material. Yeah, correct. Well, now, an uncaused cause. Now, this is from the Oxford Handbook of Late Antiquity. We're going to look at what Plato has to say. Now, we do realize Plato has his very dark side, and in some cases, for you know, in our terms, he's a little bit all over the place as well. But So Plato has a top-down approach, a top-down view, right? And with... so. For him, he's also, so these Gnostics or these pagans have this irreducible principle, that is the atom, and these atoms connect together on the basis of shape or whatever it is, and they produce more complex things. And once there's a certain level of complexity, you have consciousness, fine and well. Plato has a also an irreducible view, but he comes from the top down. And this is what he calls the intelligible rather than the material. So the universe, the cosmos, is an intelligible unity. It's, it's an understandable unity. We would call that God, right? And since it is evident that this intelligible unity could not emerge on its own or as some emergent property of matter, in other words, if God is a product of the universe, that means it is emergent from. So it is, therefore, it is inside the universe. It is part of the universe, created by the universe. It is just another creation, just another creature. It doesn't stand outside the universe. It is not independent of the universe. It did not create the universe. Then that would be pantheism, right? That's That would be that view. Plato is telling us this could not emerge on its own. It's an uncaused cause, which is, of course, the Thomas Aquinas view. 
where some emergent property of the parts it unifies, cosmic unity itself requires a cause outside itself or its parts, a prior principle of unity. So Plato, in this case, goes against these rationalists. Plato goes against these materialists, these pagans, in that sense. Which is interesting how they particularly pick and choose and don't examine the rationality of their position. So on the one hand, they'll, they'll adopt Plato. On the other hand, they'll kick Plato right under the bus immediately when he doesn't suit their particular view. So that's why they need to invent the multiverse to keep the chaos while observing order. Yeah, well, the simple answer is that this happens to be the multiverse that contains God as the creator. That's the multiverse we're in. Simple. Voila, Bob's your uncle. Are you, horse? are you assuming Bob's gender? Bob could be your aunt. I mean, we, we, we don't want to be, you know, personally, I'm primitive African. I think Bob's an uncle myself, but I'm primitive, uneducated. And uh, yeah, but uh, in America, I don't want you to get arrested for saying Bob's an uncle. Horse. I don't want the police, the FBI to come to your door because you said on social media that, you know, you, you uh, assumed his gender. Welcome, Francisco Allen, Pedro, kicking the scholars under the bus. I wonder where they learned that from. <laughs> exactly. Right, let's look at the Gospel of Thomas. Right. The Gospel of Thomas in Logia 24, just a little paragraph, 24 and 61, shows that the dualism of light and darkness corresponds to two types of people. <laughs> you blame your patriarchy. Yeah, yeah, you've been dyed in the wool since, what, you were born in 1903? I can understand that horse. Yeah, I was... I'm in Africa, we, we have still primitive ideas that men are men and women are women. So what can I do? Super chat isn't working. Uh, that is weird. It should work. Um, well, I have a link on coffee. I have other links. Check the description, but thank you for that stealth one, Goose. Uh, YouTube does weird things to me. Okay. Now they divide people into two camps, light and darkness, right? The, the people they call the undivided who have made the two one. They are filled with light and they shine upon the cosmos. So they have merged their evil and they have merged their light, their good. And they are those who exist in duality and they are dominated by darkness. In case you're wondering, that's you. Right. So in number 24 in the Gospel of Thomas, his disciples said, Teach us concerning the place where thou art, for it is necessary for us to seek after it. And Jesus, he said to them, He that, it, he that hath ears, let him hear. There is a light within a man of light. And it gives light to the whole world. If it does not give light, there is darkness. Now, I want you to think, this is Gnostic saying, well, you know, we have the Holy Spirit. Let's put it that way. Try to try to work along that sort of idea. I tried super stickers. They also didn't work. That's, I have no idea why. I don't monetize my channel in the sense that I, I run no ads on my channel. But that functionality should work. But, um, yeah, not sure why. Uh, not sure why. Um Thanks for trying Stealth Mongoose. Uh, but there are some other links, and, but I appreciate the effort. All right. Now, in number 61, Jesus said, Two shall rest upon a dead, a bed, sorry, two shall rest upon a bed. One shall die, the other shall live. Salome said, Who art thou, O man, and whose son? Thou hast mounted my bed and eaten from my table. And Jesus said to her, I am he who is from that which is equal. To me was given of the things of my father. Salome said, I am thy disciple. And Jesus said to her, Therefore I say, when it is equal, it will be filled with light. But when it is divided, it will be filled with darkness. Now, what I want you to think of in this case is, Bob's an attack helicopter, my bad. I thought he was a fire hydrant. I, I, Bob could be a coffee cup today. It's villainous, yeah, but yeah. All right. XYZ, welcome. Thank you. Good to see you. All right, so think of this, though. What you've got is this view that, remember, the bad God, the evil God, attacked the good God, broke off pieces of him, of light, that splintered and fell into this evil world that the bad God created, this evil universe the bad of matter, because only spirit is good. Therefore, faith, spirit, right, from a Gnostic point of view, only this is good. Now, the good God has a part of him that's missing. It's trapped in this evil world. And of course, they need to end all life on the planet to send all those sparks of light back. And then, of course, the good God will suddenly be as strong as the dark God. He will regain all his light and there will be a balance in the force. Understand? So now these people have merged because there's no such thing as bad and there's no such thing as good. They're just balance. They're just equal harmonies. There's no such thing as evil. It's just, you know, it's just... 
good and evil are just both sides of the same coin. That is not the Christian view, that is the Gnostic view. This is what's implicit here. Now, the gospel message is that this is a deeply flawed and even heretical view. The teachings of Jesus, as recorded in the canonical gospel, show that good and evil are opposed. They're not two sides of the same coin. Yes, they're not yin and they're not yang. That's a very Chinese view, but that's an agnostic view. So Buddhism has a Gnostic element. Good and evil are opposed. They are not partners. Evil is the absence of good, and God's ultimate plan is for good to triumph over evil, not for them to be equal or, and this is the religion that is actually in, in, in Star Wars, bringing balance to the force. Understand? So yeah, that, that these Gnostic ideas made their way into various Hollywood properties. Right? It's a butchered version of two will be one, and one will be taken, and one will remain. Exactly. Exactly. These are, these are, it's just, yeah, it's just corruption of biblical understandings. So the idea of undivided people who have made good and evil one is not biblical. This is, of course, I want to be one with the universe. Well, okay, that understands. You've got to merge opposites. You have to merge contradictories. This goes against logic, goes against the Logos, is not Christian. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Salvation is not through secret Gnostic wisdom. The biblical message is not about balancing light and darkness or finding a mystical oneness. Christians follow the teachings of the apostles, not the Gnostics, right? So just keep that in mind. So this is also where these ideas are related to that. Um, <laughs> in Black Hatter, Bob was a young recruit with an unusually large chest and no facial hair. <laughs> okay, right. So this is what black and white checkered floors in Freemasonry temples represent, right? Actually, that's a fair point. Um, yeah, the, yeah the, the, the merging of the light and the dark, the balancing of the light and the dark, that could well be the case. There may be some other associations with that as well. But yeah, we, we, we want to vanquish the dark. We want to see, see the good in Ascendant. All right, so let's have a look at Charles Darwin. He's an arch materialist. And he said, what a book a devil's chaplain might write on the clumsy, wasteful, blundering, low, and horridly cruel works of of nature. That's his letter to J.D. Hooker in 1856 in his Correspondences, Volume 6. You can find these references online in uh, under, it's called, oh, good grief. Let me find it for you while I'm here. <clears throat> yeah, You'll find this here. This is called Darwin Online, and you can find over 9,000 pages. I think he's got about 13,000 pages in his works. And here you can find over 9,000 pages, and it's some of it's quite revealing. It's really, really interesting. So Darwin Online, this is the, the official source of Darwin's materials. They, they have the scans of the original letters. They have the scans of the original books and so on. You know, the handwritten notes. So you can find the originals here side by side with the scans and the rewritten sections. So this is really detailed. And very useful. Yeah, the gospel is not squeezed in a cave or viewed in a hat. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, okay, now let's continue. Now notice, this is Darwin talking about this, this chaotic cosmos, right? With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Napoli Stag, welcome. So Darwin had the doubt about the convictions of his mind and those of other human minds because these minds developed from lower animals. And is there anything of value in those minds? Is there anything of value in our convictions? And would you trust the convictions of a monkey's mind? Don't forget, there are other rationalists who are trying to claim that your mind doesn't even exist. Your personality doesn't exist. You don't exist. You're an illusion. Your consciousness is an illusion, right? And they're trying to convince you that you do not exist, which is so crazy, right? So this is the confusion that this leads to. This is Darwin's doubt, yeah. Now, he actually says additional things. I'm going to quote some more of it. There are some points in your book which I cannot digest. He disagrees with, he means. The chief one is that the existence of so-called natural laws implies purpose. So he rejects natural laws and purpose, the cosmos, in other words. He prefers the chaos. 
I cannot see this. I cannot see then that there is necessarily any purpose. But I have had no practice in abstract reasoning. So, okay, he's got no practice in abstract reasoning. And I may be all astray. Nevertheless, you have expressed my inward conviction, though far more vividly and clearly than I could have done, that the universe is not the result of chance. So Darwin had a conviction that the universe is not the result of chance, yet he still goes and says it. And this whole atheist slash scientific establishment has taken this on board. So it's very interesting. Even Darwin had doubt. but So he was ignoring or denying some evidence. Well said, he is a monkey, a descendant, yeah. Uh, so we can ignore all he said since it cannot be trusted. Exactly. Metaphysical Joker says, of course, the monkeys are bathed with the use of luck soap from India. Yeah, well, they, um, probably. And he goes on to write, remember what risk the nations of Europe ran not so many centuries ago of being overwhelmed by the Turks and how ridiculous such an idea now is. The more civilized so-called Caucasian races have beaten the Turkish hollow in the struggle for existence. Looking to the world at no very distant date, what an endless number of lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. Now, this leads us directly to World War I, which was fought specifically on Darwinistic principles. The Germans were going to clean up the world and make it better. They were going to clean up the filth from the world and therefore improve the world, bringing greater progress and development by killing the lower races. And that's exactly what Hitler did. Hitler was a materialist. He states that. And Hitler was a Darwinist. You see, the civilized races are going to eliminate the lower races. This is Darwinism. This is what it brings you. This, If you're an animal, we can kill you. You're a lower animal. Or if you're just, I don't know, a clump of cells or just random atoms, there is no penalty for killing you. There are no natural laws. There are no moral laws. Yes, the chemicals that are randomly reacting in my brain makes me smarter than you. Atheist, yeah. My lack of free will, you know, which is in the minority versus people who believe in free will and believe in religion, those in the majority, we are actually the outliers. We are greater than you because we are the rejects from whatever. Sounds like 1940s Germany. Exactly. This is where this thinking leads and it has moral implications. So let's finish up. So the pagan origins of determinism with the advent of philosophy, the relationship between divine power and the power of necessity was reformulated. So Greek philosophers in the 6th century BC analyzed the laws governing the cosmos and developed a mechanical determinism. So they perceived the cosmic laws as mandating all action. Now you've got determinism. Before you had purpose, right? The telos of the universe, you had the cosmos, which was organized by some kind of deity. Now you had this ananke, or Latin for necessity. This was the divine principle responsible for the creation of the physical world. Now, in this necessity, this, these are physical laws. So you have no freedom from the physical laws. You have, this is why these atheists have this, these, this, this atheistic or materialistic determinism. Of course, there's very little difference with that and theological determinism as, as taught by and preached by Martin Luther and John Calvin. Hitler gave the Muslims a pass, I know, because they were his buddies, right? Leukippos and Democritus attributed Ananke as the driving force behind the movement of atoms in their descent, thereby introducing determinism into atomism. So now, this is where this whole idea of material determinism comes from. It is purely based on these pagans coming up with an idea two and a half thousand plus years ago. And this is just pagan thinking, but it's now called science. So it's tragic when you talk to people and realize how devalued they become in their own eyes because this evolution nonsense is correct. I've got a series on Darwin and that explains a lot of, well, all of Darwin's nonsense. So this determinism raised concerns amongst critics of atomism. If everything was determined by the atom's fall and dependent on chance, right, there would be no space for independent human agency or moral judgment. So this removes human agency and moral judgment and individual actions would merely be governed by the atoms. Isn't that right, John Calvin? John Calvin merely applies this as a theological force, as a, right? He just calls it God, but this is not the God of, of Christianity, of Orthodox Christianity. So Plato associated necessity with fate. Aristotle made a distinction between what he called bia, an external force that stops a body from achieving its purpose, 
and physical, logical, and metaphysical ananke, necessity. The Stoics, they saw physical necessity similar to our understanding of natural laws, but they tried to avoid strict determinism. So these are the different metaphysical positions or philosophical or theological positions held by these people back then. Now, to uphold moral responsibility and the belief in a benevolent deity, the Stoics also separated haimarmim or destiny from ananke, right? Because now they're trying to say, look, this is kind of irrational. We need to find a way to look at these metaphysical qualities. Do we have a benevolent deity? Do we have purpose? Or is there lack of purpose? How do we find a middle way? Hello, Barrington Bennett. Now, God respects our free will. I've got 12 more slides or 13 more slides to go. So in Christianity, God is the creator of all things, including the physical universe and the laws of nature. However, God also gave humans free will, which is the ability to make free choices unconstrained by necessity or determinism. We've just had a brief look at this pagan view, the Greek view from way back in the day. Now, while the physical universe operates according to the laws of nature, human free will allows for independent moral choices and responsibility. That means that you are responsible and therefore you can be rewarded or punished. So yes, everything is random. However, however it is determined random. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it, horse? It's, it's precisely determined randomness. Yeah, it, 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 my brain hurts just thinking about that. Bradley Johnson, welcome. Great to see you too then. Thank you. And all right, so in Christianity, we believe God is omnipotent, but he voluntarily limits his power to allow for human free will. So God can override human will if he chose to, because we do believe in his, in his omnipotence. However, we also believe that God doesn't do contradictories. God doesn't do things that are irrational. God doesn't do things against his nature. God doesn't do things that are illogical. Now, God allows humans freedom to accept or reject them. Necessity and determination or determinism are subject to God's will. They are not independent forces that limit God. So, in Christianity, the ultimate destiny of each person depends on them making the free choice to accept or reject God's salvation through Christ. So, God is sovereign, but he allows our eternal destiny to depend on our faith, not an arbitrary or determined outcome. This is, again, the Calvinist and Lutheran view. Martin Luther, Calvin didn't get that idea from nowhere. He got it from Martin Luther. Martin Luther got it from the 6th century where it was condemned by the Catholic Church. It was called the predestinarian heresy. Those idiots got it from the Gnostics who got it from these fools. Understand, these ideas that are present within the Protestant doctrine, the Reformed doctrine of Luther and Calvin, these come from heresies, known heresies that were multiple times um, rejected by the Catholic Church, declared to be heresies, that you have no free will, and that Therefore, salvation is entirely arbitrary and punishment is entirely arbitrary. This means that justice does not exist. It denies the part of God's character where he is just. He punishes the wicked. He rewards the good. If you have literally no control over what you do, how can you be guilty? How can you be rewarded? It was something beyond your ability completely to control. Right? So, now... The future is open and undetermined until we make our choice. That is for us. God stands outside of time. God sees all our choices. He allows these choices. He knows these choices. He stands out of time. Time was created when God made the universe. Before that, there was no time. God existed in the eternal present. So when he created the universe, time began to flow. But that doesn't mean God doesn't see it. Now, in Christianity, God does not operate based on arbitrary chance or randomness. People make choices and God rewards or punishes. Now, we realize there are mysteries in God's will and there are mysteries in his reasons for allowing evil. Yet, God has an ultimate purpose and a plan for creation. And that plan centers on human redemption and relationship, not a meaningless physical causality. Not billiard balls in your brain that just make you do things at random. Now, when I do part two of this, the next part of this, I don't mean part two of this particular presentation, but the next part, we will talk about that from a purely scientific point of view. We're going to look at just how scientifically this idea of materialism is completely bogus. Horses, yes, but there were heresies that just hadn't been done correctly up until Luther and Calvin. <laughs> Good point. 
good point. Uh, always says pseudo random, but that implies a programmer. Yeah, yeah and none of this is, is is sensible. Okay, so it always scared me that some atheists take pride in the fact that they are ultimately insignificant. How does one take pride in being completely insignificant? Sounds like Gnostics. It's it's insane. It's it's nihilistic. Yep, true nonsense has never been tried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so good. That is so good. Uh, yeah, that is... Good grief. What just happened there? For some reason, that did not work. Let me try that again. Yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah, true nonsense has never been... <laughs> Very good. Okay, let's continue. Let's finish this. So... Point five, in Christianity, humans have moral responsibility precisely because they have free will to make real choices. Your choices are real, not because your actions are determined by necessity, by chance or arbitrary destiny, by physical laws, by atoms banging together in your brain. But Catholicism, Orthodox could not alone hold the might and power of Jesus. <sighs> um, metaphysical joker, you must have been joking when you made that statement Right, because if we can demonstrate that those ideas are all entirely Gnostic, some of them are pagan, and all of them are known heresies that were rejected by the early church fathers, and you're proud of them, yeah, number one, then there's a little problem there. Okay, so Blue Light Moon, welcome. And Tigger just told my co-worker an atheist what I'm listening to. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah, oh, did you trigger them? Okay, now, free will is required from a Christian perspective for love, morality, and meaning. Determinism destroys this. So, if strict determinism is true, there is no basis for justice, there is no basis for fairness, reward, or punishment. Justice requires moral responsibility. If our choices are predetermined, we have no moral responsibility. We are just acting as programmed or necessitated with no free choice. I mean, what is necessitating us? What is this thing that's necessitating us, right? It would be unjust to hold someone morally responsible for actions beyond their control. Fairness, likewise, requires free choice. It is not fair to reward or punish people for outcomes dictated by necessity. Fairness requires that people, A, make free choices that lead to proportional consequences. Determinism destroys the concept of justice, just as Calvin did. She turned red and looked like she might explode. <laughs> T tell her that, yeah, so Tigger, yeah, tell her that that you are predetermined to listen in. You can't, there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so rewards and punishments only make sense if people could have chosen otherwise. If there is only one path you can take, determined by forces beyond your control, then reward and punishment have no meaning and no purpose. They do not encourage freely chosen behavior or correct a freely chosen wrong. Understand the irrational, this is just error compounded upon error in their thinking. Determinism is morally corrosive. Meaning and purpose require free will. If our lives are scripted by determinism, we have no real purpose or meaning. We are just acting out a part, right, with no choice as to what we do or what we become. So life becomes a charade with no moral responsibility or free choice. Love requires choice. Forced or determined behaviors are not true love. Love must be given freely to be authentic and meaningful. What if God had no choice? He has to love you. And then he hates the next guy for no reason whatsoever. Utterly random, totally arbitrary. What about your kids? You hate one kid, you love another for no reason. They're your kids. Like you, you love them, right? So Calvinists live as if people are not determined. They preach the gospel and tell people they won't be saved if they don't convert. I know it makes no sense. So, determine allows for no free giving and no free receiving of love. It destroys the conditions that make love possible. It eliminates the foundation of justice, fairness, purpose. I've already said that, right? So, we have to have free will. We have to be able to make choices and then suffer the consequences or reap the rewards, right? So, if you have no free choice, life is arbitrary destiny and we have no control. So, the concept of justice, ethics, and love evaporates without free will. I hope Calvin is listening. Now, let's look at 6th century scientific paganism. <clears throat> now you go to Epicurus. Well, well known. Epicureans denied involvement of divine beings in human affairs. These are the Epicureans, often linked to atheists, right? So the Stoics understood God, Logos, fate, and cosmos to be one. Now, we might say that's very Christian of you. Yes, however, they also called this particular concept Zeus. 
So the greatness of the cosmos demands that it be brought forth and ruled by a cognizant force, not chance. So in other words, if if you have all of this, if you have this this non-chaotic world that has to be governed by reason that is conscious, not by random chance. Atoms being necessitated is reminiscent of Nietzsche's will to power. Your lectures have really shown us how this necessity in metaphysical and religion added onto science. Yeah. Is there a difference between Epicureanism and Hedonism? Um, we've already spoken about the whole Hedonism thing. I did. I covered that very recently. Let me have a quick look. Uh, give me one sec. Let me see where I did that. Uh, fault type. PowerPoint. Yes, I covered it in part one. <laughs> it's in my atheist philosophy talk. Uh, let it load. Give it a second. It'll find the reference. I covered it in this talk. Hedonism. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Determinism is an unjustified extrapolation into the future of an observed fixed past, but God has given choice into the future. Yes. Um, every knee will bow, and even those that don't will probably be broken to be bowed. Yes. So the only recourse to them would be to embrace a writer to go that we are like a book that... Pres Sorry, I don't follow you, OATX. I'm not following you. So in practice, determinism collapses faster than the house of cards blown to the wind. Yeah. Now, the Stoics, they faced logical, moral, and theological problems. Even they realized that their position was potentially incoherent. Even they realized they couldn't fix these theological problems based on their, the stance they'd taken, the, the, the philosophical position they'd taken. And they had a problem reconciling their belief in a predetermined course of events with their commitment to the unity and cohesion of the cosmos and its all-encompassing reason. How can you have predeterminism when you've got a guiding force that is conscious, that's God or Zeus? So does did Zeus just make a cartoon that's just playing out? Understand? So they realized even their view was incoherent. Now, as the world and everything in it, including humanity, is brought forth by God, it and everything in it is imbued with reason, the Logos. Now, this is, the, this is of course, the Stoic view. And Numa... Okay, so it is imbued with Logos and Numa, we'll define that later, and has part in the divine. So the deterministic notion of fate, as it was developed by the Stoics, is based on their particular cosmology. Posidonius added the influence of celestial bodies on human fate. So now we're talking about astrology from another pagan Greek, and he goes, hey, I got, I'm a pagan, I've got these wonderful ideas, and now it became science, right? And of course, it became very popular astrology, <laughs> right? So, there is no uniform fate doctrine, but the Stoic definition of Hemad Mim is that of an uninterrupted chain or network of causes, a causal determinism. So they're still determinists, but yet they want to claim that there's a God that watches over things and created things. It describes a closed system in which everything has its causes in that which precedes and affects it. So we do believe in cause and effect. We also believe in chance. We also believe in choice. Now, this bears on the question, of course, again, of moral responsibility and what's called theodicy. Let me go have a look and check that term. So, let me just bring this up. So, theodicy is a branch of theology that aims to reconcile the existence of evil or suffering in the world with the concept of a benevolent and omnipotent deity. Now, the problem of evil, this is a major argument used against Christianity, used against the existence of God. Evil exists, therefore God doesn't exist. Okay, water is wet, therefore dogs don't exist. Uh, my cup is empty, therefore Starbucks is closed. My battery is flat, therefore Apple computers don't exist. Those two, that's a non sequitur. It doesn't make sense. The evil exists, therefore God doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, no. All right. So this tries to answer the question of how a loving and all-powerful God can allow evil to exist and why suffering is a part of human experience. So theodicy attempts to provide philosophical or theological explanations and justifications for evil, often considering factors like free will, moral responsibility, and the greater good. Be careful of this term, the greater good. This very much is a Gnostic, atheistic, socialist Marxist view of things. This is utilitarian philosophy. And I covered this in my atheist series and socialism series, socialism series. It depends who defines that greater good. And of course you end up with evil.
Okay, so you now metaphysical joker. I'm gonna put you in timeout for talking absolute poop. All right, so kindly don't talk poop. I have no interest in nonsense opinions. Right now, <clears throat> so we come to this point of the problem of evil and moral responsibility, and this was raised against the Stoics. So they had an incoherent position. They try to uphold one position while upholding a contradictory position. So Carl Sagan, the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. Now, he believes in the cosmos as well, because we know the Carl Sagan series. Harriel Johnson, welcome and thank you for joining. Thank you very much. So we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. So the cosmos doesn't know itself and it somehow brought us into being so that it can know through, okay, whatever. Every one of us is in the cosmic perspective, precious. Okay, I thought the world is random and we are just a collection of random parts and babies are just a clump of cells. And that's in Cosmos, A Personal Journey 1980. This is actually the K here is from a, this is a Polish version of the book. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. In the pale blue dot, a vision of the human future. So, yeah, so this is nihilistic. This is very pessimistic. And here, we're all precious. You're so precious. Uh, yeah, but you are obscure. You're a lonely speck. No one's going to help you. You're alone. Get lost. No one cares. You're precious, though. Um, okay, thanks, Carl. You're making a lot of sense here. Christianity may be good and Satanism evil. Under the Constitution, I have a both on neutral. Okay, thanks, Carl. Maybe you should shut up by now. Just stop speaking because just making it worse, Carl. This is an important but difficult concept for many law enforcement officers to accept. They are paid to uphold the penal code, not the Ten Commandments. Yeah, at some point, and he talked about the U.S. Constitution and the America that was founded as a Christian nation. The fact is that far more crime and child abuse has been committed by zealots in the name of God, Jesus, and Muhammad that has ever been committed in the name of Satan. Um, Carl, you really need to get your head out of your butt. Many people don't like that statement, but few can argue with it. Yeah, we've looked. The fact that people don't say I'm doing this in the name of atheism doesn't mean that atheists don't do things because of atheism. Like the French Revolution, they did it in the name of atheism. So yeah, this is Carl Sagan, great thinker, great thinker, smart man. Then science came along and taught us that we are not the measure of all things. Hold on, now he's going against the whole materialistic position, going against the atheist position. Man is not the measure of all things. Okay, that's fascinating. The universe was made for us. We long to be here for a purpose, even though despite much self-deception, none is evident. So we want a purpose, but there's no... We're deceiving ourselves to think that the universe is made for a purpose, and there is no purpose that is evident, and the significance of our lives and our fragile planet then is determined only by our own wisdom and courage. So now we are the measure of all things. We are the custodians of life's meaning. We are the measure of all things. Okay, I thought we're not, Carl. We long for a parent to care for us, to forgive our errors, to save us from childish mistakes. But knowledge is preferable to ignorance, okay? And Gnosticism and complete random trash information is also good, Carl. Better by far to embrace the hard truth than a reassuring fable. If we crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal. Marx found it called socialism, led to gulags and like 60 million dead at minimum. Mao, he's on 60 million dead. And of course, you've got um, Hitler and others that found themselves a worthy goal. Thanks, thanks, Carl. I guess, okay, fine. Carl Sagan, everyone. Carl Sagan, smart guy, smart guy. And Carl Sagan then tells us, an atheist is someone who is certain that God does not exist. He defines atheism correctly, my golly. Someone who has compelling evidence against the existence of God. He's telling us that atheists know God does not exist because they have evidence that convinces them so. And Carl says, I know of no such compelling evidence. Okay, Carl, I thought you were... I am confused now. Are you as confused as I am? And this is in conversations with Carl Sagan. Okay, this is his book here. Because God can be relegated to remote times and places and to ultimate causes. We're back to ultimate causes now. We would, I thought there was no cause. Hold on, I thought there was no purpose. I thought he, what? Carl, I'm confused. We have to know a great deal more about the universe than we do know to be sure that no such God exists. 
contradictory to say the least. <laughs> How confused was he? Yeah, well, if you read about Carl Sagan, you read about you read interviews with friends and family. He claims, yeah, Margaret Sanger was sure of her cause as well. Yeah, let's 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 kill all the babies, right? Even after they're born. That was Margaret Sanger. So Sagan claimed to be an, an agnostic only because he couldn't prove scientifically that God didn't exist. He was an atheist. When you read, when you read interviews about him, for all intents and purposes, Carl Sagan was an atheist. He hated the Christian church. He hated Christianity. Yet, this is incoherent. I mean, where, where does he stand? Who knows? Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. And of course, he's not my scholar, I guess. When I presented this to some atheists, they were like, Carl Sagan is not my scholar. I heard that someone before. Can't can't be sure where. Okay, let's look at the pre-Socratic era. Seven more slides to go. <clears throat> so they believed in a universe composed of earth, water, air, and fire. Yeah, the occultists all do the same thing as well. So understand. So now, hold, that's occultic. Oh my golly. These philosophers that these atheists and that these rationalists all rely upon, these materials rely upon, they're occultists too. Great. Fantastic stuff. Okay. And here we got Gorgias. Right, as well. Remember, he said nothing exists. And even if it does exist, you can't prove it. Okay, fine. Nothing to do with Islam. Yeah. Okay. So now, if Plato's to be believed, Gorgias believed in nothing. And he was the first known nihilist. And of course, he's the first known materialist. And of course, this is an atheist belief. Protagoras famously said, man is the measure of all things that only what our five senses can deduce is true, is real. That's where you have your truth. Because what the next guy perceives, that's his truth. There is no objective outside truth. Only what is inside your tiny little mind is true. This is this is, this is is uh, Gorgias here. Is this Gorgias? Democritus, sorry, my bad. And all that exists, all that exists can be judged against man's sensation and interpretation of it. If it's all only your interpretation, objective facts do not exist. Reasoning and logic do not exist. Evidence is thrown out the window and under the bus. Right, and now you've got Protagoras's relativism. Now, of course, man is the measure of all things is a well-known psychobabble atheistic belief, and it is relativistic. Therefore, it is illogical. It goes against logic. Yet these people claim to be logical. They're full of poop. I hope you can see that this makes no sense. This is just this is just pagan philosophy. It's not even philosophy. It's it's just error. It's just stupid. Right. <clears throat> Greek and Roman materialism. So the materialist tradition in Western philosophy can be traced back to Leucippus and Democritus, or Leucippus, who are Greek philosophers from the 5th century BC. Earlier pre-Socratic philosophers like Thales of Miletus also had materialistic ideas. I'm getting this from Britannica, by the way. Democritus, influenced by Leucippus, believed that the world is made up of individual visible particles called atoms in empty space. In other words, physical matter, little balls in space. These atoms can be extremely small. They can interact with each other through impact. Again, billiard balls knocking around randomly and or hooking together based on their shapes, like Lego. What made atomism appealing was its ability to explain changes in objects as a result of configurations of unchanging atoms. The atoms stayed the same, but they could be rubbed off, broken off, and so on. Now you've got your little physical particles. And this stands in contrast to the view of Anaxagoras, who believed that, for instance, bread transforms into human flesh because bread inherently contains the characteristics of flesh. In other words, when you eat bread, it makes your body because bread transforms into flesh. That's a literal transformation, right? Because bread contains characteristics of flesh, and therefore when you eat apples, apples also contain the characteristics of flesh. And that's how apples make your body. Okay, fine. Thanks. Great. So... He's a medical doctor. Pedro says, Was well, today in physics class, my professor said that the leading theory for the origin of the universe is that nothing was unstable, therefore everything happens. This is science, I suppose. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Everyone speaks of um, there's the, the theory of evolution. What's interesting, and people don't realize, before the theory of evolution, there was the theory of constancy, that things don't change. And there's plenty of evidence for things not changing. The theory of constancy. Somehow that gets forgotten when everyone speaks of everything changes. There's constant dynamic change. Well, things actually stay the same, right? Democritus further proposed that the soul consists of smooth, round atoms, and that perceptions arise from motions caused by atoms of the perceived thing. 
Thanks, guys. And Epicurus, a Greek philosopher who died in 270 BC, had a significant influence on materialism. Let me get rid of that CE. So before the Christian era. So it's here. Oh, bugger. Yeah, get rid of that. Excellent. So, so he had a significant influence on materialism because through his philosophy, he he wrote a lengthy poem by, by okay, sorry, his philosophy was taught by Lucretius. Now I covered this in the I think in my Darwinism series. I spoke of Lucretius and Epicurus, right? And there was a poem by Lucretius, and basically this is also one of the fundamental foundations for evolution. Roman poetry. Who would have thought? Pagan Roman poetry, foundation for evolution. <laughs> Good grief. So Lucretius was a Roman philosopher of the first century, and he was teaching these ideas by Epicurus, right? And Epicurus shared the materialistic view of Democritus. So he introduces this concept of an absolute up-down direction in space, suggesting that atoms fall in roughly parallel paths. This is how we get motion. This is how we have our uncaused cause, our first cause, because atoms all manifested at the top and they're just falling downwards and that's how we get yeah that's how that happened that's how that happened it's all physical properties only okay there's no god it's just all physical the atoms are just falling and and so don't question the science lord yeah i won't it's so yeah also the assumption in all that in all cosmologies that laws of nature is constant it was the same billions of years ago as it is now but that's an assumption so yeah, there's, I, I guess the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. BCE just means before the Christian era. Just, just reinterpret it as before the Christian era. So when they go CE, just say Christian era, and BCE before the Christian era. Fixed. So yeah, there you go. So now this, so atoms fall, and that's why it is predetermined. That's why you have this, this, this predeterminism. They just fall. And of course, but there's chance that happens. They hit a speed bump or a I don't know, they hit a little turbulence in the air and they, they move by chance. That leads to variation. That's how they explain variation. Greetings from Scotland, Maximilian W. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoy the videos. Okay. So now, Epicurus philosophy has a significant ethical dimension characterized by a form of enlightened egoistic hedonism. So now, this is why materialism is ethical because of Epicurus. Epicurus says we've got morals too. Where do you get it? Same place we get the falling balls that just randomly move by chance. So, top G says, it was invented by atheists, didn't want to write BC, so they came up with BCE, adding an extra letter, and just making things harder for themselves. Yeah, before the common era, of course. Just call it before the Christian era. Just seriously. AD refers to the, the year zero that they're all using, you know, Jesus' birth. Just remind them of that. Okay, so this refers to a philosophical position that combines elements of self-interest, pleasure, and a supposedly more enlightened or thoughtful approach to life, to seek personal happiness and well-being, while also considering the well-being of others and the harmony of the community. Don't forget, Hitler was thinking of the well-being of others and the harmony of his community, and therefore everyone else had to die. That was Hitler with his enlightened, egoistic hedonism. Of course, Charles Darwin said that when the civilized races kill the lower races who are lower animals we are making life better we're bringing better life it's kind of we're just we're just kind of cleaning up the bloodstream here we're just you know cleaning up the gene pool a little bit we're making things better yeah that's that's a enlightened egoistic hedonism because this is for the well-being for the good of all for the good for the greater good for the greater good of the world the greater good of life the greater good of the harmony of our do you understand how this is actually just evil dressed up to sound pretty so you need to see here secular humanism, utilitarianism, existentialism, and secular Buddhism. Yeah, Buddhism as well. Sadly, but true. Buddhism. So, so there are plenty. I'm not going to go into this. <laughs> I wonder, should I, should I mention what these philosophies are about? Do you want me to discuss that? Or should I skip over that? Please drop me a one in the chat to let me know if I should discuss these philosophies, what they are, or if I can just ignore these. Okay? I'll give it a moment. <clears throat> so materialists trying to justify morality will always be the funniest thing. Yeah. Okay, I guess. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to destroy my throat. Okay, so there are several modern atheistic or humanistic philosophies that share common emphasis on seeking personal happiness and well-being while also considering the well-being of others. 
But you see, this is a very this is not a Christian view where you've got this this these absolute moral values. You've got don't forget this is for the good of what is your tribe, your group, right? What keeps you surviving and not necessarily them surviving, right? So these philosophies prioritize human flourishing, right? Darwin believed in killing off the lower races because that would lead to human flourishing, as did Hitler and as as did the World War One Germans because that's exactly what they believed. They were killing off thirty million people for the good of human flourishing. And they believe in ethical behavior and social justice. Secular humanism. They emphasize reason, ethics, and compassion in guiding human behavior. And that's why they have euthanasia now, you know, so you can get yourself killed in Canada. Because, yeah, you you lost a leg, you know, you're no good to society, you're draining us, go kill yourself. All right? That's where that leads to. This is very, very relativistic in terms of its morals. So they focus on ethical principles that lead to personal happiness. That's why we have the rise of people trying to promote... Um, diddling little kitties because that makes them happy. Utilitarianism is a consequentialist ethical theory that advocates for actions that maximize overall happiness or well-being. It's a formula. It's a mathematical theory for goodness. It suggests that individuals should act in a way that produces the greater amount of happiness. Well, you saw the riots that were happening recently, those, those, um, those peaceful burnings and lootings that led to great happiness for many people. That was, that was happy, made them happy. There was there's no other standards attached to that, as long as they were happy, right? They were very happy. A great number of people were happy about that. Personal happiness is considered alongside the well-being of others and the community as a whole. That's good intentions. And what is paved with good intentions? The road to hell. Existentialist philosophies, diverse, often emphasize the importance of personal freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom to do what? That's Gnosticism. Gnostics claim they just want freedom. Freedom from... Moral constraints, freedom from the law, because thank you very much, Ariel Johnson. Much appreciated. Don't forget, men can get pregnant. Yeah, freedom from rules. Yeah, we want to get pregnant too. Anarchy. Exactly, Joel Thomas. These are lovely words. These are euphemisms that hide relativist moralities that actually ultimately are satanic and evil, that lead to chaos. All of these things lead to chaos. They aim for personal happiness and the well-being of others. Secular Buddhism. Secular forms of Buddhism, which separate the teachings of Buddhism from religious or supernatural beliefs. Oh my gosh, haven't we seen this before? Just secularism, secular humanism. They emphasize personal happiness or well-being alongside compassion, mindfulness, and ethical conduct. Secular Buddhists, they strive for personal liberation from suffering. <clears throat> do for me before they do unto me, so blah, blah. I don't want to suffer, so let me kill those people so that we don't have to suffer. And they recognize the interconnectedness and interdependence of all things. Fantastic. So, so those are those philosophies. Notice the buzzwords that they use, right? Notice the, the appeals that they make. But yeah, eugenics. Okay, so let's have a look. Paganism goes enlightened. Four more slides to go and we will be done. So Thomas Hobbes. He's an English philosopher who advocated for an atomistic materialism. Where did we get atomistic materialism? Oh my God, from Greek pagans. Thomas Hobbes, famous philosopher, very smart man. We need to respect this man. Listen to what he says. But hold on, it's merely just more paganism dressed up in scientific, scientific language. So he makes significant contributions to the development of mechanistic and physiological psychology. Your thinking is purely caused by atoms knocking around in your brain. He proposed that sensations are physical movements in the brain, but he avoided the complex philosophical questions about consciousness. Which, of course, was followed, which was explored by his contemporary, René Descartes. So I'm going to be talking about these guys in the future, and you'll realize these people are idiots. Seriously. You look at their philosophy, it is, it is based on just dumb thinking. So, Descartes' dualism. Didn't we speak about dualism and unitarianism earlier? Okay, so he believed in the separation of the mind and the physical world, viewing them as distinct entities. Great. To him, animals were automata. They were just mechanical beings. Darwin said that we are just animals and therefore we are automata. We are just mechanical beings. Isn't that just fascinating? So, now, this mechanistic, this mechanistic aspect of Descartes' philosophy was later adopted by materialists in the 18th century, including a guy called Julian de la Maitre, who applied Descartes' view on animals as mere machines to human beings. Never saw that coming in his work, The Human Machine, or Le Homme Machine, or Man a Machine, The Human Machine. You're just a meat robot, buddy. 
<laughs> so, Harriel, thank you very much again. I do appreciate the support, everyone. As I said, I don't monetize my channel. I don't earn anything on the video views on my channel. Um, last month, I had 116%, or rather this month, I've had 116% growth in my views. I have had no, no extra growth in my in my subscriber count. So I, while my views doubled, my more than doubled, I actually, it's weird. People are not subscribing, but thank you. We do need more Lloyds, yeah, too few Lloyds, yeah. Thank you. Christianity purges itself from the coercive diddlers, then straight away diddlers are reading stories to kids in public libraries. Coincidence? I think not. Do you know that teachers, for instance, people speak about Catholic priests diddling kiddies, right? The incidence of this kind of crime amongst priests, Catholic priests, is five times lower than the Western social average, right? If you look at where these people, where you find them, is in school. School teachers shag every little kid they can get their hands on right? This is a serious problem in schools. It's a major problem in schools. We should ban schools. I mean, because if Christianity is bad, if a few priests did it, holy moly, do we need to ban schools right now because of teachers who have five, at least five times more of this crime. And then, of course, when you look at the statistics, okay, the Catholic Church is a monolith, effectively. It's one big target you can hit. You look at the Protestant churches, the 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 level of crime of kitty diddling is even higher in the Protestant churches. I did a couple of shows on that once. I went through the stats and I showed it. Protestant priests are diddling more kids than Catholics. Just just seriously. But of course, you know my, my church is only four people in it, and I'm I'm the priest, and we've never diddled kids, so therefore Protestantism is safe. Yeah, okay. There's like ten billion Protestants. You're three people, and you didn't do it, so therefore you're a representative sample. Sure, tell me another good one. <laughs> I I stink, therefore I am. Because remember, it's all only about physical properties. I ooh, I stink, therefore I am. That's how I know. It's not a brain. It's because I, I stink. Ooh, keep those arms away from me. All right. So now, Denis Diderot. I spoke about him in my atheism series. I covered him in depth at one point. He is the chief editor of the 18th century Encyclopédie. He supported a broadly materialistic outlook by considerations drawn from physiology, embryology, and the study of heredity. And his friend, Paul Baron de Olbach, published his System de la Nat Nature, or whatever, the System of Nature. This guy was the first outright Western Enlightenment era atheist. So he expounded deterministic materialism in the light of evidence from contemporary science, because they claim that science supports their views, reducing everything to matter and to the energy inherent in matter. Where do we get the energy? Well, because the universe is strictly up down, as the pagans told us, these 2,500 year old Greeks told us, and the atoms fall down. Okay, but you know, in the universe, there is no down, there is no up in space. So, okay, fine, the stuff falls down, and random fluctuations cause them to swerve, swerve, and then you get, you get variation because of random swerves in falling at it. Okay, thanks, pagans. Right, so here we go, right? Moving on. So he promotes a hedonistic ethics as well as an uncompromising atheism. Now, where are they getting the morality from? Why is it always France and Germany? Germany. Is that to say, if I do not think, therefore I am not? Yeah, don't think about pink elephants, top G. Don't think about flying pink elephants. Don't think about, don't think about, great steak on a bun. Don't think about that. Then because you, then you're not. YouTube is clearly fudging the numbers. <laughs> so <clears throat> okay, so Germany, Hegel. Um the French materialists of the 18th century were in direct opposition to Orthodox Christianity. Do understand if you look at my series on the French Revolution, the cult of reason, atheism, the cult of reason, you'll see just how irrational, how violent, how genocidal the the Enlightenment atheist thinkers were, how anti Christian they were, and they were killing in the name of atheism. So, yeah, atheists need to really get their history straight. And this is why they ignore history, because history proves how how toxic, how destructive, how evil atheism has been. And especially they hated the Catholic Church. So in the 19th century, a different orthodoxy emerges in Germany, Lutherville. The Hegelian and Neo-Hegelian philosophical tradition named after the German philosopher Georg Wilhelm, sorry, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Okay, great stuff, except we know that he's a partial Gnostic, he's a hermetic, so his ideas come from Hermes Trismegistus, so this is a fusion of these two weird Gnostic traditions, right? So now this led to a reaction by certain writers, who's with those with backgrounds in biology or medicine. You had Ludwig Buchner, 
and Karl Vogt were among them. And of course, who did this Hegel inspire? Karl Marx. Karl Marx looked at his ideas, his materialistic ideas on the purpose of the universe, which is based on atoms banging together, leading to a higher purpose. Well, I thought you've got... I didn't realize that, that when you leave the universe alone, it actually evolves. I thought it supposedly goes into... Um, what's that word when you leave something? Um, it, it eventually finds rest. Uh, sorry, there's a word, and I last week I forgot it as well. But when you leave something, it tends to eventually um, entropy. It leads to entropy. Somehow these guys are claiming that entropy doesn't happen. You get evolution. You get improvement. How when you leave some, when you leave a loaf of bread alone for a month outside, entropy causes it to rot and to crumble. It doesn't improve. It doesn't evolve into a Porsche or a Ferrari. It, there is, understand, so the, already these ideas are incoherent. <clears throat> so Karl Vogt gains the notoriety for his claim that the brain secretes thoughts like the liver secretes bile. I don't have control of my thoughts. The brain just secretes them randomly. Wabba, cabba, bagger, do, boo, boo, ice cream, Biden, ice cream, need. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, my brain was just secreting stuff. Of course, this is a Gnostic idea because the monad, Albert, secretes things. It secretes beings. So, yeah, that's just another Gnostic idea. Speak for yourself, Carl. Okay, so understand. So my brain is just secreting stuff, just like your brain, right? It's just randomly secrete. So thinking is actually like a physical fluid. If we can get some of that fluid, we can inject it into a few atheists and they maybe have a few different ideas. I don't know. That's science, right? I'm, I'm trying to be scientific here. So this metaphor of secretion, previously used by this guy, by a different guy called Cabani, a French materialist of the late 18th century, is of course now considered to be foolishness because it doesn't make sense to think of thoughts as a physical substance. That didn't make these idiots not think that this wasn't a good idea at the time. So this last point takes us back to thoughts as chemicals, which atheists and scientists hold today because they believe that chemicals sloshing around in your brain, physical reactions lead to impacts of atoms and impacts of chemicals, and therefore you think. So these twits, these atheists, are appealing to a seven to a 1700s idea, which is obviously trash. Do you understand how these scientific atheists are just idiots? Like the Quran secreted the Quran. Yeah, so do you, does this make any sense? I mean, honestly, what I'm trying to show here is Christianity, Christian thinking, logic versus these fools that claim to be truly rational, truly scientific, and we are the idiots. We are the, we are the, we are the, um, the ones with superstition. And I mean, this is what they believe. So when we discuss pious sex and modernism, which is coming up in January, we will once, th those slides are down already. So anyway, we will once again visit Germany, of course, because Germany, oh my God, it's like the bearer of all heresies, right? Hegel and a few Lutheran Protestant theologians. So we're going to have another look at Luther, because Mr. Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther, pr pr Prophet Martin Luther, of course, just, just revived a bunch of old heresies and said, hey, that's Christianity. And then, of course, you've got Lutheran Protestant theologians who was like, yeah, we like those heresies. Let's let's call them Christian too. And Hegel, of course, we need to visit him. So, guys, last one or two slides and we're done. Neil D, is philosophy of science as a field any better than these vocal atheist masquerading scientists? Philosophy of science is actually really a fantastic field. It teaches you the history of science. So you learn a great deal about the history of thinking. And I, I, there are certain philosophers of science that I do follow, that I listen to their talks, and they're brilliant men. They're genuinely brilliant men. They, they speak of some great things. Of course, you have some idiots. Just, I mean, you should, we're all smart enough, I think, to figure out who the idiots are. Um, I can't remember the name of the one guy, but let me try and find one of the great philosophers of science that I listen to. Um, Stephen, Stephen Meyer. Okay, so here's one example. I just brought this up because I thought of it. Stephen Meyer, Stephen C. Meyer, this guy. Um, he is a philosopher of science. He was educated at Cambridge. Brilliant thinker. I mean, so, so they think about science in a very particular way. They define and they clarify. They are able to explain things really well. So, so um, philosophy of science, I think, is a fantastic field. And it explains how we got to the thinking that we have, what is bad thinking, what is good thinking. I have this book. I've bought a whole bunch of his books. And again, i got to thank my audience for supporting me the way you have. It's been really fantastic. I've been blessed. I've been able to buy a lot of material. I've bought several of his books. I've read them. Um, they are very, very good. Let's have a look. Let me see. I've bought um, 
So I've read a number of his books, The Return of the God Hypothesis. I don't think I've read it yet. I believe I have it. Darwin's Doubt, Signature in the Cell. I would recommend Signature in the Cell. It's fantastic. Both of these, Darwin's Doubt and Signature in the Cell, is, let me just open that one. And this one I've read, I've watched like everything on YouTube by this guy. Um, it's really good. So Signature in the Cell, right? This is um, worth buying, I think. It's worth reading. It's fantastic. And Darwin's Doubt, definitely very good. So yeah, have a look at Stephen C. Meyer, okay? Uh, where is he again? Where did I see his name? Uh, Stephen C. Meyer, this guy. Look him up. Well worth listening to, all right? Okay, so now briefly we're going to look at phrenology because atheism has also birthed a bunch of insane, just hysterically foolish ideas. Okay, so here we are reading someone's brain. No, we're not actually measuring brain current as such. We're looking at the the, the bumps on their brain because your thoughts are created by atoms moving and of course your, your brain is purely just, your mind is in the brain. Your mind is purely physical, nothing metaphysical, no soul. And therefore, atoms moving around, chemical sloshing around creates your thoughts, right? And therefore, the shape of your brain would have a physical effect. Like if you look at the, the, the let's say you take a a billiard table, right? Pool table. If the table had little bumps and weirdness and shapes in it, it would affect when the ball hit the rubbers on the sides. You know, those weird shapes, little protrusions, odd indentations and stuff like that would affect the path of the ball. And therefore, your brain, is the, the, brain the shape of your brain affects your thinking, Let's look at phrenology. This is an atheist materialistic idea. This is science. This is definitely science. Here you've got Franz Josef Gold, 1758 to 1828. And these different areas of the brain, like here's the hope area, here's the immortality area, here's the firmness area. Uh, here is the ice cream area. Sorry, no, it's the cautiousness area. Here you've got the inventiveness area. Here you've got the tomato area. Here you've got the vegetables. No, sorry, that's the causality area. That's the locality area. The continuity area, and here we've got whatever. Okay. <clears throat> now, phrenology, when it became very, very popular, it reached its peak, was controversial and garnered immense criticism for reasons ranging from the methods of Gore's experiments to its supposed promotion of materialism and atheism. So, based on these crazy ideas of materialism and atheism, they invented these crazy sciences. All right. <clears throat> so, let's see. Um, so welcome Andrew good to see you Nat G. Lloyd do you know the book Evolution and Other Fairy Tales by Larry Azar no I do not atheism is perfectly logical and rational says Joel and I recommend C.S. Lewis essays on YouTube for anyone who's, ever heard them, who's never heard them and he told the story of his secretary how he was kicked out of a scientific establishment for promoting his book about intelligent design yeah atheists acting like totalitarians nothing new exactly yeah so let me see um, okay, so then, guys, also, for many books, please have a look at my Google Archive. Check in the description for the link to my archive. Do a search in the archive. It's searchable. I have loads of books on these topics. I have, I have an amazing amount of books. I have over 2,000 in there, okay? Okay, so phrenology was criticized from its inception, from the beginning, from those who believed it promoted materialism and the belief that all phenomena are caused by material processes and atheism and thus the destruction of morality. This is from Greenblatt, 1995. Phrenology in the journal, I think, Simply Psychology. So well-known psychologist, right? Writes that atheism destroyed morality. Morality wasn't something that you was objective, something that was eternal, right? Something that was based on a moral lawgiver. But what you had was uh, little bumps in your head that when the atoms bounced against them and the chemicals sloshed against them, you'd have ideas. So this was entirely relativistic. My morality... It's not your morality. I can steal your ice cream and lick it anytime I want, right? I can beat you over the head anytime I want, whatever. And this is the kind of idea that these guys have. I have the right because it's my morality. Your truth, don't forget, if you take athe um, the atheist idea and the Oprah idea of your truth, my truth, well, then it's my morality versus your morality. Do you understand where this leads? This is a very bad uh, philosophy. Last couple of slides. So, in a lengthy critique of religion, natural and revealed, the Methodist quarterly review scoffed at Fowler's dramatic claims to falter before the void of atheism after having so ardently professed the primacy of phrenological over theological truth. So this, oopsie, so this phrenology nonsense, this touching the bumps on the head and working out who you are as a person and what you believe and how you think and how much intelligence you have, this um, was greater than theological truth. It was a religion. 
the pictures of one side of the head was there ever a picture of the other side i have not you probably there was they had skulls they had actually um they had these skulls that were made and then you could see like the whole thing so they would have both sides yeah they had but they had these full skulls they actually had the you can look it up if you look up phrenology you'll see people had their own little ideas their little diagrams and they, they give you a map of your head right and um they'd show you what's what but there were supposedly these fixed areas the good is the good whatever that good is defined in either way yeah so we believe in god is good god is goodness goodness is part of the nature and character of god it's not something that's relative to them it's relative but notice this phrenology became greater than theological truth it was the theological truth it was a religion right so notice here they speak of here his arrogance his dogmatism and his particular theory of the relations existing between phrenology and revelation because they were getting revelation Harold, this is my last slide i'll be like two minutes and we're done so yeah phrenology touching the bumps in your head this is science this led to revelation thanks thanks atheist materialists so that's revelation that's where we get it from because chemicals sloshing around in the brain so materialism undermines morality final slide and we are done materialism holds that only the physical world exists all phenomena are the result of material interactions and physical processes there are no immaterial minds or souls this implies there are no objective moral truths and no objective moral values those would require some non-physical foundation all that exists is matter extending into space, physical things. If materialism is true, our thoughts and actions are the inevitable product of a causal chain of neural firings and biochemical reactions in the brain. We have no free will and no agency. So it destroys your personal agency, it destroys free will, it destroys morality. We are biological machines acting out our programming. There can be no moral responsibility with this kind of view. Materialism implies that there are no objective moral rules or duties that transcend human minds and human societies. Yes, yeah, the bumps in your head that determines revelation. <clears throat> moral rules would not be grounded in God or any other transcendent source. They would just be the product of human minds, human emotions, and human culture. So they're relativistic. One culture doesn't want you to steal their stuff, and the other culture wants to steal their stuff. And it's okay because it's culturally determined. And moral relativism follows from materialism. Thus, materialism is incompatible with objective morality and with Christianity. And materialism leads to moral anti-realism and relativism, which undermines traditional moral beliefs. And that's where Darwin went. That's where Hitler went. That's where World War I came from. That's where Sam Harris is and all of these idiots, including Dawkins and others. And that is the end of my presentation. I hope this has been educational, right? And... Um, yeah, apparently on YouTube, you have to say things like, welcome, my beautiful pagan believers uh, to my channel. Welcome, you beautiful, amazing uh, something. I don't know. You apparently have to do that. So thanks, guys. That is it from me. I hope this has been educational, has been useful. And you also have to end off with a proper YouTube ending. It says like, so, Wayne, what are we going to do today? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Or something i need to come up with something one day so guys thank you very much for the time thank you very much for joining as a member harriel thank you all for the donations i really appreciate those um yeah so hopefully you've learned something atheism has no leg to stand on it is ridiculous it is an utter joke understand for all of these reasons it is a complete joke so hopefully i've tied together a lot of dots hopefully you've gained something out of this you can see that your beliefs are not irrational your beliefs are sensible your beliefs have a philosophical foundation that is reasonable it has a scientific foundation that's reasonable we're going to cover that next week or later this week i might do it some more um so yeah we'll do another one on this to show you exactly how reasonable scientific and rational our ideas are these this christian worldview is versus the complete junk that is this pagan atheist worldview we matter yes guys so thank you very much i really appreciate your time thank you for taking the time to be here with me and Lil Main, welcome. Good to see you, Tom Gyokai. Very welcome. I didn't catch every single comment, but I do try. So guys, thank you very much. Good night. God bless. And I will see you guys soon.